说不好听，我想说出来我忘了。<笑>老板没听谁说过。Are too me too. <laughs> Don't alienate the female listenership. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be interesting to know actually what so far the proportion of a uh, male to female Black. level is. We can get that through YouTube. Oh, uh, viewership. Yeah, I think we've had one female. That's my sister then. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we pinpointed exactly where yeah. it's come from. Nice. All UK, uh, yeah. all male. Really? Yeah, we've had one over. No, before your sister, there was one female. I think it might have been my girlfriend's mum. Right. Okay. Because it was over <coughs> sixty or something. She didn't make talk. Uh, Paul take his dog off for the sake of this. Yeah. <laughs> I have a few ghost accounts that I'm technically a female in, so I'll just start listening on those. And really? We'll, nice. we'll get your female. What stats inspired in. those ghost accounts? Hmm. <laughs> 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 we'll come to that. Are we are we live? Yeah, no, we're oh, yeah. clapping. Clap one. One. your hands. One, two. That was awful. That was a t- <laughs> yeah. if, I mean, if we I thought you had, was on two. Don't you need one, space two. in between each clap so you know how to sync it? Or are we all trying to Just sync? Just one clap. One. Sh- Sorry. Okay. okay. One, you, you two, three. three. That, was Ooh, awesome. that was a good clap. Shout, shout. That was that was good. I feel good about that one. <coughs> the reality is, uh, when you get into final cut, you just automate it and you don't have to do this at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just like it. We just like the clap. There's an AI program for that now. Yeah. Speaking of AI, our tradition is to get AI to write the intro to the podcast and have the guest read it out. <clears throat> all right, so this is the AI intro? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Dude. <laughs> I want to limit all my interaction with AI. Forget all that shit. Man. I like that. So I'll wait till I get into this. That's a big statement from Canada, guys. I'm breaking all the stereotypes. <laughs> We're not actually nice. Down with AI. The other oh. thing you're breaking is we brought canvases into the portraits of each other. Oh, man, yeah. And you've got it in landscape mode. Yep. I'm breaking rules, breaking stereotypes. I've already got perspective down of you guys. Nice. Been I challenged. Think, uh, get the Sharpie out. I think you've got that the wrong way around because uh, Daryl's arms are not that size. That's you, mate. I oh. know exactly. That's my point. <laughs> We're hitting deeper issues. Yeah. <coughs> I haven't. Body Daryl, dis- Daryl, body is, Daryl <laughs> is still a chair. <laughs> right? I'm just You're not happy with the size of my arms. Perspective. Get your arms in it. Let's see. This is him. Yeah, yeah. Look, look at the size of that. That's a pretty light. That's like a 20 inch bicep. <laughs> 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 so get some body dysmorphia issues straight away. And brackets, not. Not the scale. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, mine is, uh, <laughs> mine is going seriously wrong already. <laughs> <laughs> Stop Fucking hell. Make his arm smaller. <laughs> why, is look he, like why is he drawing me like a Homer Simpson, like the, the circle around the mouth thing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like Homer That's Simpson that, your, that was the original size of your head, and then I thought, I saw that was not, oh, he's actually using all the canvas, so. You ever seen those like step by step drawings where they like start with a sphere and then they'd add yeah. two spheres? Mm. My dad can like do a perfect Mickey Mouse every time because he went to like some convention in Disney and like for brand training they like taught him how to do like a perfect Mickey Mouse. Right. So even like twenty years later, he's just like out here drawing Mickey everywhere. I, think I could do with that. Yeah. <laughs> Only thing the guy can draw, but hey, granted. My uncle does like caricatures. Like if I had one for my thirtieth birthday, so he'll do like my face obviously and then like wee things that my family have asked of, about my life and stuff but they're they're so good uh not cut that story out, shall <laughs> <laughs> i was just saying because you look you've, you've gone you've, you've got off to a reasonable start i've got practice because uh i do these stupid drawings for amanda in the morning every morning i'm bored not every morning no are you guys the type of people who will like do or like stop at like a I don't know, like a busy touristy place where they like do like those like character drawings where they like make your ears really big, your nose really big, or whatever, and like make you like really exaggerated. Do you guys do that? When I was younger, I absolutely loved that. Really? Stuff. Yeah, I haven't done it recently. I've never no, done I've one. N- I've never. No? Done it. No. My ears are huge, so I'm I don't quite. Know what yeah, I'm just kind of worried about like if you're thinking. His about, dad like, might your, be able to your, draw you. <laughs> just your, <if> <laughs> <laughs> it's true, and if you're only worried about your arms, mate, then you go to the one of those caricature people. Yeah. You're gonna be looking like one of those bad guys from my, Spy Kids. My ego couldn't take it, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so, yeah, we've not done an intro, so... So we've kicked out the AI intro, which I like, because this is a chat about creativity or creative endeavours. Um, so we'll, we'll just forego... Well, who are you? Uh, my name is Paul Matz. I'm a actor, writer, director, filmmaker, and occasional stand-up comedian. But not that occasional. Well, not that occasional anymore. I mean, no. uh, I guess I started in the beginning of the year. Um 
and I've been doing it like three or four times a week since since I started. So what are the clubs that you frequent? Uh, so I've done, um, there's a couple in Glasgow that I've done a lot now. So there's um, the lounge at 142B St. Vincent Street, which is like really close to Glasgow Central. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's Nico and Dovalu that does that show um, every other Tuesday. And that's actually an African-owned venue. And so I guess they get, get an audience from like going to an African restaurant that's like owned by the same people. Okay. And they like put out flyers and stuff. So every time we do that show, it's usually like not really the comedy audience, so it usually creates some interesting um, yeah, yeah. happenings. The other ones that I do a lot are um, Jester's, which is that park bar near Ibrox. Um, that's every other Thursday, so I do that quite often. And uh, Salsa in Merchant City. So there's like all these like pop up ones that are like every other, usually every other week. Then like I'll kind of like moonlight that with like gigs out in Edinburgh or um, like one time things. Like I did the Britannia Panoptica. A couple weeks back, um, I did a show at um, Patty Linton has a show uh, called Tenants Laughter Lounge. It's at Tenants Bar on Byers Road in the West End. And that was a really fun one. That was like a um, by invite sort of thing. So he was like, hey, do you want to do my show? And I was like, oh, hell yeah. So that was like a cool moment. That was like my first show. Or something? Yeah, it's in the basement of Tenants Bar. It was a good good crowd. Like there were like people who kind of go there all the time. Mm-hmm. So it was like um, it, like in contrast, to like Nico's show is like a well-cultivated like audience that like knows kind of how to be an audience for comedy. Yeah. Because it's almost like something that you have to learn. Um, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a strange thing. So, like, the vibe is completely different. And if you're just, like, trying jokes out in an audience that kind of uh, is a bit more brash or, like, um, like more tending to, like, heckle and stuff, it's kind of hard to tell what's working and what's not just because there's a bit more chaos in the room. You know what I mean? Like, you can feel a bomb a lot harder when there's not. When, when people are like waiting for a punchline, yeah, it it's either happen. it's either like a really good reaction or like it's an actual bomb, yeah. And then so there's like more of that like you get a better reading of what's going on with when it's like an audience that like does comedy, yeah, yeah. See something I'm fascinated in in terms of doing stand up comedy. See your very first time, as in you saw that you could say. Did you sign up before you had material? Did you have like a couple of things that you thought was funny and you just went for it? Or like, how how did it come about? First time doing comedy. Um, <coughs> it was actually really impulsive. It was when I first moved to Glasgow in uh, like the first month of 2022. I'd moved down from the Highlands and um, there was like a bistro kind of place called Tebow uh, in my East End neighborhood. And I saw they had like an open mic thing and I got way ahead of myself. And I was like, oh, great, let me sign up. Uh, so I went inside and they're like, oh, do you have any spots left? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, let me do five minutes of comedy. And I was like kind of the whole month prior to that, I lived in the Highlands and I was just like watching loads of stand up. So right. it's like you can kind of convince yourself, especially if you're not talking to anybody, yeah, you that could, you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? How much how much like, lead time did you have between signing up and actually being on stage? I think like four days. It's not much. So I had like stuff because I, cause I have a writer, right? So I have like a lot of stuff written, but then like actually trying to figure out like what can I do? on a mic in front of people that's going to be funny. I kept on like writing like something that was like not a joke really, throwing it away, something that's not a joke really, throwing it away. So I got to do the actual show. Not only was it like so I get there and it's not even a comedy open mic. Is it just a general open mic? Yeah, it was like people doing like Fleetwood Mac covers and poetry. Right, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> they're like we have a stand-up comedian in the audience and I'm like, "Oh, well, this is bad, right? The only comedian, in the yeah. Show. I was the only person doing jo- doing jokes in the whole place, and I got cold feet on like some of the material that I even had. So I kind of just like completely died up there, and that was like a, almost a full year removed from when I ever tried it again. Yeah, you know, you, you know you, what I mean. Do you remember anything that you said? I say, what was um, the I, oh, it was like maybe the the week of the Ukraine thing. Right. I, I think I brought up Ukraine, and I've, I had my friend there who was just like, "Get off of Ukraine, man! Move on." <laughs> um what else did i do um anything i said that night it's probably been repressed now it's not it's no longer <laughs> it's no longer so a memory that's... i have Fair access to um but i but yeah like th- they're not even jokes that i do anymore and i don't even know if like i had like really like a, a punchline or anything funny in there like i didn't appreciate stand-up comedy as the art form that it is that i recognize it now like for a while longer you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. the good thing was because I bombed so hard a full year ago when I was thinking about like doing it again. That's when I was like, oh, like I actually have to write some real stuff, like real yeah. solid stuff. So once I started doing it again and having that experience of like knowing like that was an actual bomb, 
like there was like no one in the room that was laughing and they were just like people were just like doing like this like full on like head scratching oh, like no. what is happening right now right now what do you like react in any way or do you like start sweating or do you um i mean i think i was sweating up and went up there yeah, yeah. um <laughs> but like it was it was bad but <laughs> <laughs> the, the the nice thing was it was actually really liberating because the second time that i did it was like what i don't know 11 or 12 months later and i had better stuff written mm. some of it was funny some of it wasn't but it was like i'm i'm never gonna bomb that hard again so yeah, it was like little, just little the little fact little. that i was like i got up went back and did it again yeah it was like the worst is is behind me and it yeah. always will be because that was such <laughs> a bad first time that uh it, it, it actually it's like literally like liberating i was like all right i was like all right yeah not gonna be worse than that you can only go up worse than there yeah literally how, how do you find the like you said you you do or you did writing before yeah and then you just kind of turned your hand to writing jokes how, how did you find that like transition was it um similar or is it completely different i think it's very different because i started writing what was basically kind of a hobby like almost like journaling like back in 2019 2018 and that's like when i like first started like giving myself credit for like even being remotely creative and then um what i find with with that kind of writing is like you just sit down and you just go you know you write whatever you did in your day whatever you did in your week you write about a recent holiday and then it evolved into more like fictional stuff because I was like interested in actually like trying to write stuff that wasn't about me for once. Um, the comedy writing is almost like, for me, it's like I've got to catch like random thoughts, like stray thoughts, which is why I have like the little blue notebook all yeah. the time. So it's like if I think of something funny, then it's like catch it, write it down, and then you got to like dig it, dig through it, and re like revisit it and like really really figure out like why that was funny in the moment, and then try to like provide context for that. So whether it's like a play on words or like uh just like a funny premise i don't know i don't know um because like when we were out doing some of the, the photos on sunday evening quite yeah. often like we'd jot down just after a, a word or a conversation <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well you, you, every moment is kind of an opportunity if you if you don't waste it yeah is there a reason why you prefer to write stuff down rather than type it into a phone um it depends on what i've got on me i've really started doing this blue notebook because um if i feel like a heavy thing in my pocket like it's almost like uh, expectation that something's gonna get written in it whereas like my phone it's always you, you know when you like pull out your phone and you just like what was i even yeah. why did i even pull this out like you're it's like you're suddenly you're on instagram or you're doing something else you're checking emails that that's don't, like you're not waiting for an email that's got a very specific purpose yeah that it, yeah it's exactly that thing rather yeah. than like everything else the phone provides yes yeah. as though because you get the notes app so i get the, the the notes from the journal the little blue book mm -hmm. into the phone and then you start to categorize oh, this joke works in that sort of bit right. under that premise. And then it's nice because you can, like, copy-paste, move things around like that. So are you quite, like so are you quite methodical in, like, how you do these kind of things then? Mm, yeah, I've become methodical because you start to, like, I've uh, been doing this for, what, four four months, like, actually doing comedy kind of regularly, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed, like, okay, I'm not going to just do the same act for these same crowds. Like, if I go to the lounge or if I go to Jester's, I need new stuff, which is like a huge reason why I started bringing this around because I don't want to be someone who just does the same five minutes and tries to like make it work. That's like Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Like if you're not getting laughs on the same five minutes, yeah. it's not, it's not going to happen. So you've got to constantly introduce new stuff. And so those, those two shows, especially I see them as like my opportunity to like, just like kind of work out and see what's funny. So I, even when I started doing that, I would bring my notebook up and be like, oh, okay, here's what I was thinking, like, da, 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 and really work it out in front of people. Half the people in there are like comedians usually, and the other half is like like a non-comedy audience. So if mm -hmm. something really is funny, you are going to get a good feedback from yeah. it. Um, and that's kind of how the process works for me now, where it's like some of these like nicer shows with like a bigger audience, I'll have more of a refined set that's like my go-to, um, like, like set up punchline, set up punchline, set up punchline. I kind of meander when I'm just like trying stuff out and trying to see like where the funny is, and and sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it does. Yeah, yeah. And you know, <clears throat> so I know I think it's Seinfeld and Larry David have like their yellow notepad and book, and I think Mark Normand always takes about like three or four notepads like that. Yeah. Is he like? I think you mentioned him before. Is he like one of the guys that kind of got you in when you said you were watching stand up in the Highlands? Like, who yeah. were you, who were you watching? Uh, at that time, a lot of Mark Normand, a lot of Sam Morell, um. Who else was uh, was I watching? I think uh, Norm Macdonald had just passed away, so I was watching a lot of like YouTube of Norm Macdonald, yeah. and I just loved like his like 
dry like you almost like know what he's like that, what he's gonna say yeah. he just like pauses and stutters about it and then he finally says it um so he's got he's got a great kind of uh sense of humor um who else was i watching i really like um kind of like these guys that go up there and just like really focus on like their joke structure so like the that's what appeals to me about like sam Morrill and mark norman because i can like see like how strong like the writing is behind it there's other people that are like more like performative, I guess, like that are that are equally as funny. Like, don't get me wrong, like a Burt Kreischer, like he's hilarious. Like he rips his shirt off on stage and everything. But um, I, I like to like really like almost like you're like popping the hood under something mm-hmm. and you like got to see like what fits. Like, how does how do I set that up so that the word words are established for the punchline, but like they don't know what's coming yet? Yeah, I can tell know? if that was a really clever dig. Like he's hilarious. He takes his shirt off. Because that's also what I think. <laughs> he's hilarious and he takes his shirt off? Or he's no, hilarious I, because... I, I don't know if he, that was like a dig as in like... Some people, you know, like they, they're a master at their craft and they write jokes and other people take their shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he is hilarious. Yeah. I think he is, yeah. I'm warming to him being on podcasts and stuff, but I didn't, yeah. I didn't like his stand-up just because mm. it felt gimmicky. But I know it probably is a gimmick for marketing and he's like very good at marketing. Yeah. Taking his shirt off and he's got his beast story. But then aside from that, I suppose there's an art in storytelling and, and his stories all seem to be like, my daughter said this, somebody mm-hmm. said this to me, yeah. this happened to me. Yeah. Whether they're real or not, I don't know. But it wasn't like, I don't know. There's a, there's a few huge yeah. comedians that I kind of don't, obviously it's subjective, but I don't really get. Another one is Chris Rock. Yeah, like I know he's amazing. He's always really intelligent with the stuff he says, but it's more like a TED Talk to me. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm not sitting there laughing at his special. Mm. I like him. Yeah, I think the stuff he's saying is clever. But I'm not like sitting killing myself. Whereas if I'm watching like Bill Burr, or, like Carlin, or Mitch Hedberg, or something like that, right, I'm, like, yeah, yeah. I'm like laughing. But I don't know if there's anyone that you have that with that is like you don't get or you what your taste is. Someone that just like kind of bounces off me, but I still kind of like appreciate the work, like yeah. like a Chris Rock for you. Um, I don't know. There's a I think I think Bill Burr might be one of those for me. Like uh, mm. the the other day, I was thinking like Bill Burr is like he's always on like that kind of angry tone i love his jokes i think he's hilarious but i'm never i can't really like bring up like one joke that i think he's like super super funny so like i don't have like a favorite bit of his whereas like other comedians that i really like i can kind of like pick apart and say like oh that's a really really good bit yeah like mark norman has a great one like he's always like comparing one thing to other like that's kind of his writing style so he's like um like one of his bits that he's like saying how close it is or how glad he is that he grew up to not like kids you know so he's like i used to yeah. and now i don't but i used to like grape juice and now i drink wine yeah yeah but i still like grape juice that like to me is like such a funny joke and it's like so clever that's like for me that's like a standout one i can't there's some comedians like a bill burr or like a chris rock that i don't really have a standout bit but i can still appreciate yeah what mm-hmm. they do up there it's almost like within comedy like it's almost like music you've got different genres within the same space like music is music but you've got hip hop, rap, folk, yeah, yeah. all that, jazz. If in comedy, you don't have people the same. People take their shirt off. Yeah, you got people take their shirt off. Got more considered yeah. like how you construct like words and sentences to make to pull the audience in. Yeah, and you got people who are like more performance oriented. Mm. I'm not really settling into like one one genre yet. I'm still kind of like figuring that out because obviously, like I've been a comedian, like a uh, comedy fan for like over a decade, like 15 years or something. Started out like watching like YouTube clips of like George Carlin like way back like like early days YouTube before I even had like ads I think, um, and uh, so, you know so you figure out pretty quick like yeah there's like storytellers there's one liners there's like dry delivery there's like really animated delivery, um, and I don't even know where I am yet like I was like pictured I was gonna be like super dry super mm-hmm. like deadpan kind of like one liner, kind of bit maybe a bit shocking but. I don't even know if that's that's my angle anymore. So it's kind of been interesting to like really figure out like an on stage identity, if you if you could call that finding your voice. Yeah, yeah. Because what you were saying earlier, like you don't want to do the same five minutes. So do you find that, let's say you're at the lounge and it's the non comedy audience, or yeah. you're somewhere else with more comedians or a comedy audience? Do you think not only does your material change, do you think your voice changes because you're trying to please the room rather than sticking to what your voice should be? Mm. There's been a few times that um, there's a, a couple of people that I've, I've like done comedy with like on the same night, like a few times. Like this guy, Sean Reed, has been like really good on like giving like feedback 
like after a show, I'll be like, oh, so when you're trying that new stuff, you really like really loose and like you're walking around a bit more. But when you s- went to the the stuff that you usually do, you kind of shrank and you stayed the same, and your body language changed. And uh, so it's it's interesting to hear from other people, especially other people that do comedy, like why I'm doing something new versus or like being more relaxed or maybe a bit more nervous energy even and then i get comfortable and i just kind of shrink down so that was interesting to hear about but um there was a there was a night where we we had no audience i went to edinburgh and it was supposed to be like uh you know at least like 10 20 people in the, in the audience that we were doing jokes for ended up just being comedians so at that time like i was just like i'm not even gonna like do any animation in my voice because i want my jokes to work so i was mm-hmm. like i'm just gonna say the exact words i think are funny in my head but like super dry yeah. and if they chuckle then they think it's funny yeah you know what i mean it, it's it was almost like super super zoomed in kind of like trying to figure that out so i, I at, a, at a certain point i want to be more animated and, and more you know like more gesturing and stuff like that it's just kind of hard to break out of that um that like mold that you set for yourself because mm-hmm. like I've, i do acting right so like if someone tells me to do something i'm just you just do it yeah. But it's almost because, like, you feel like you're being, um, like, it's my own words, it's my own thoughts that I'm doing in, in stand-up comedy. So it's like you've got to, uh, I guess, reconcile the fact that you are being criticized by the audience for your own thoughts, your own actions, your own yeah. personality. It's all there's on there's you. nothing to hide behind. No. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing at all. Yeah. Whereas so I think you can hide behind the fact that someone's told you what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, what can, you can always be like, I don't know, know who wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But you do write as well, don't you? Yeah. 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 Uh, it's how, fun, man. how did you get pre that side of things? Like what was your what was your background? Um grew up in Toronto, Canada. Um and I uh, was like kind of like a decent student, not great student, went to university for um criminal justice. Thought it was gonna be like big shot, like yeah, Rob Kardashian, you know. <laughs> uh dropped out in four months. Right. Um, from there, I uh, started working full time at my part time job, which was at the time a little Greek butcher shop in uh, in the east end of Toronto. Um, so I worked there for like five years. Um, kind of got quite comfortable there. Got really good at what I did, which was like being the butcher slash like customer service guy slash like kind of managing the store. Right. Um, and then. I at some point I think it was like 2017 I left there did some hospitality jobs, um, and then COVID happened jumped out of hospitality for because everything closed yeah. right um, and back to the butcher shop for like a few months before I uh, moved here, so like up until moving across the ocean I never like gave myself much credit for being like a creative type person yeah as I was like I'm left brain um, like and also like I kind of had that like. Um, thought about myself where it was like, well, if you dropped out of university once, like that's kind of like your bar now. It's like, that's kind of, you exist here. You're going to like work at this butcher shop or you're going to like do hospitality jobs. Mm. It was like, yeah, right. So How, what, what, why did you drop out of the, that degree? Uh, I was like not ready for it at all. Um, I think part of it was like my like um, disposition about school was pretty much, I, I, I think I was smart enough in like high school to not try. Like I think I, um, got like good enough grades to get like a decent scholarship without ever really doing homework or really like putting yeah. myself into like the projects or something yeah um like assignments etc so you get to university and it's like completely different story right everything is like kind of on you mm-hmm. and there were a couple classes that i really found interesting like i there, i did like a elective american history class i, was, I thought was fascinating and i was like super into that but it turns out if you pass one and fail four in one semester uh, <laughs> they don't ask you to come back <laughs> so uh, that was basically the main problem was like I was just kind of immature and what and age would you been then uh 18 yeah because I went through a similar thing because straight out of school I went into merchant navy training yeah um and I did a wee bit more than four months but not a lot yeah. longer and then jumped out of that into basically like various sort of electrician like just handy things like helping people out here and there for six seven months before yeah. I went and studied my, um, my degree in current state management and that was a total change, but I was I feel like in a similar position to you. I was, wasn't in the mental headspace to actually go and do yeah. that thing. I'd have been far better working just jobs for a year. Yeah, yeah. And then going um and finding something that was meant I to d- be in. I do feel like there's also there was an element of like what was around me at the time. Like 
I don't think any of my yeah none of my no one in my family was in any like arts entertainment creative space at all so even if I like was that kind of person like you kind of want someone to go first like to go ahead of you right yeah so all my family is doing like um anthropology degrees law degrees um both of my parents were like working kind of like corporate type jobs so uh that was kind of like well i was like if i'm gonna ask for advice on something and i'm asking like nowadays i'm i'm quite uh in a nice position because what am i gonna ask my my parents advice for you know what i mean they have no idea like anything about the industry in like the best way possible yeah so like if i'm asking my parents like oh should i like go like do like freelancing stuff or like should i try to get like some like cushy position with like bbc uh, they're like we have no idea mm. and again like that's kind of like more of like a freedom to me is like yeah they're just like just do good right <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a nice thing um so i feel like maybe may, who knows if uh if there were like more like artsy fartsy people in my family like from a younger age maybe we would have i would have been doing more like drama or, or visual arts or something but i was always like really shy so like that kind of kind of uh energy like wanting to perform or anything I, I didn't know that I liked doing that until, you know, uh, 14 months ago. Yeah. So what was your, if you're shy and you're doing like stand up and comedy, uh, stand up and acting, yeah. do you find that that helps you in your, in like the rest of your life outside of those things once you've done it? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think like, um, it, it, it helps a lot of things. I don't know. Um, there's, there's times where, I've been like really anxious just to like um chat to someone like let's say what's an example like um uh, like trying to figure out like I have the this like car got to try to get it reinsured or so I've got to call the insurance company like there's like little things that like I know are going to be like annoying conversations that I have to kind of be like why am I not getting what I want mm -hmm. and then they have to be like well because this is this is this and these are the rules and I'm like well can you help me out with these, these like situations? Um, like just like uncomfortable conversations become so much easier because yeah. like, you know, once you die on stage, it's just like, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of nothing. It's honestly. not going to be any worse. Like, yeah. And, and honestly, like most people just move on with their lives. So you kind of realize like, eh, it's all good. Yeah. Because yeah. no one's going to walk, no yeah. one in a few months time is going to even remember what they saw that night. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. That's, yeah, I think that's yeah, a good yeah. thing about getting older. You realize. I know it's a cliche, but you realize how little other people care yeah. about you. Yeah. It gives you more, yeah, it gives you greater perspective in the world. Mm -hmm. And yeah, those things really don't matter. But yeah. what people admire more is actually someone having put themselves out in that position. Yeah. I, yeah. I couldn't imagine anything worse than having someone saying you have to go up there and talk and be funny for five minutes. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I would say in the flip side, you're doing this. Not everyone's like putting themselves out there on but YouTube, this is, on Instagram, but doing a This podcast. is very different. Even if it was just doing it myself okay one you've got fallback because there's somebody else is there doing it with you so if it flops then it's on both of us but there's also it's a conversation like so it's it's shared with paul at the moment so yeah. at, at the moment it's like a free a free base split and then if it really fails we can bring in we can blame david and lee <laughs> <laughs> And we've gone up to three female listeners now. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. So I've made some headway with my drawing, but uh, I've not made headway. I've made shoulder way. <laughs> yours is. Yours looks like Rey Mysterio dressed up as a pumpkin. <laughs> 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 the timing of that was epic. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> he knows his hosts. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we do a wee show and tell quickly? Yeah. Okay. I think I feel like I've really captured your shirt. All right, yeah. that, that's, that's good. It's got some buttons on it. I look uh, a bit Freddie Mercury there, <laughs> and I've got. I'm just doing it. I'm outlining, so the, that's where I'm at. If we can see anything, I don't know if it comes through. We're, we're building. Yeah. We're building. Uh, I need my glasses. Slow progress. <laughs> yeah, I'm not proud. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I did this is back in primary school, like primary one, primary two. The first day of class or the first day of a new uh -huh. year was awesome because everyone would get like these A3 sheets yeah, and you'd draw the person next to you and then they'd all go up outside the class and it was hilarious because some people were just awful at drawing it. It looked like a, like a peanut, like it looked like Strange drawings basically. <laughs> it was so funny. Right. 
if someone as a kid had me do that, then I would for sure have not been in the arts very from a very young age. <laughs> <laughs> Put a stick figure. Like, Did okay, you ever have in like in, uh, you had to draw yourself for like the school tea towel? Yeah. Yeah. I've got one of them. I think the I think fact that you just said one. school tea towel means absolutely nothing to me. I have no, no idea what that could be. We had to we were, you had to draw yourself and basically the, for the your class or for the full school depending on the size, like they would take all those little sketches of yourself. Yeah. Everyone else in the room is nodding. So it's obviously a Scottish thing. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it would end up on like a tea towel and your grand would buy it. It's basically child labour for the school to make money. Yeah. And then they sell yeah, the towels at like sounds sweet. eleven pounds or something. Yeah. Did you guys ever ever have this where like so we had this thing called like Scholastic where like you'd go home with like a catalogue and like try to sell like things to your family members? No. Like we like we books. Book yeah, yeah. yeah. Book yeah. Book so you, you try to sell book books to your family members oh, and right, then yeah. more more if you got in sales, you'd get like little like almost like McDonald's toys. But I think the valuation is like crazy. Yeah. Like your commission is like a little plastic toy or Did like a slinky or something. I just bought it myself. I'm not sure. I really can't remember if I had commission or not, but because I had every single Goosebumps book, yeah, I used to be obsessed. I would read oh, like one a night. I think, yeah. Well, I, I'm saying like the commission was like these little cheap toys, so it was like I think whatever you're getting. Was I think we got book good tokens. value. Let's try and improve our education. And then we had this thing called Family Fun Night. So then everyone, it's like a in school sort of like games night. Every classroom has like a different like game, and then you win prizes. So then for those those nights they would ask you to bring in like all your cheap toys so inevitably everyone has all these like crappy scholastic toys there was a whole circular market of like yeah. of like cheap toys and then yeah. everyone's like so then they're p- making money on this was a whole racket i just realized yeah oh my bring God. Up some scholastic stuff if we can find it online some images of it that's cool child labor alive and well in canada <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I keep wanting to just finish off the drawing. Yeah, you're very. Uh, I'm quite very happy not to. So um, the one can't give up. I will. I will. I will will finish it. The one thing that I was going to add about the comedy conversation was that like, um, the people who like do a lot of open mics and stuff, um, even those people who like kind of just like have like a five minute set that they want to like perform in front of people, I I respect all of them Mm -hmm. because like they're all very clearly like just kind of like trying to prove something to themselves and like i guess i'm doing that too right like i started doing it like i wanted like stage presence and i wanted to like feel good like it makes it feels good making people laugh so like why not yeah um but it was like kind of their skill building for me um but like everyone else is like really trying to prove like hey i've always wanted to do this it'd be like it's kind of like jumping from a high cliff or like learning how to you know ride a bike or learning how to drive late in life like some of these people are like in their 40s 50s 60s it's great yeah, that's cool. That's really great to see. It's weird to say that because I was thinking about that last night when I was out, and uh, it's like, why? Why are any of us doing any of the things we're doing currently? Mm. Um, so, what, what what's underlying for you that uh, is putting you down like th- this path you're on at the moment? So, not just with comedy, but with like, um, well, the right the writing aspects, the acting, getting more into direction. So we're searching for like a deep underlying psychology yeah, of what's happening. But philosophical. All question. right. Well, what I was thinking about I? I was thinking about this just last night because I was having a conversation with my friend, and I was honestly like, I don't know if I like process happiness the same way as other people. Because <laughs> like for me, like to be happy, like I have to like be doing like really really like challenging stuff. Mm. That's like in my perspective, like something that I don't do. So it's like almost like I have to like be turning over a new leaf like all the time. So it's like I started like I moved to Scotland and I started um, working in film and that wasn't like or uh, first I really like first thing I started doing was like voice acting and like voiceover work and then I was like okay well that's new that was challenging but like I figured out how that works and then I was like okay let's like start working in like film jobs and then I started doing that and that was a thrill and that was like great and then I was like okay well I really like performing because I got thrown in front of the camera one time so let me like start doing that more and then I was like oh I really like performing let me just try to do stand up and then, so it was like I'll, I'll, it's almost like I'm I have like an underlying concern that's like, wh- where does this go? <laughs> where, where does this ends? lead? Like, <laughs> you know, like, it, but it's great because if you look back on like where you were like a few years ago, then it's like, yeah. wow, like you really climbed like, a, like overcome like a lot of hurdles. And mm-hmm. like, so I really appreciate that. But like, sometimes I, f- I feel like I wish I just like was a bit more chilled out about this whole thing and just kind of like wanted to do one thing for a long time and like was happy. Nah. Do you enjoy like those things in the moment or is it like an after the fact thing? Do you enjoy looking back on the experiences and the moments, um, or do you? I mean, like, so on on stage when you're doing some stand up, I can understand you getting a lot of pleasure, like yeah. as a cloud, like bursting into laughter. Yeah, yeah. 
but do you get more in the moment or more after? I think it's after because I think in the moment you're like just worried about like doing a good job. Yeah. Right. So like, there, yeah, there's there's times where like you almost like forget what you're doing, like whatever like instinct it is. It's like just just get through it. Kind of takes over and like figure out how to do this, figure out how to do this, figure out how to do this, and then there's like a bit of a, a like a hop in your step. Like once you like get down and like people are like hey good job or, yeah. or however that kind of happens then you like really feel really good. So I think the like the endorphin high like happens after for pretty much most of those things. I yeah. think uh, we were talking when we were taking photos about that <coughs> creative mindset and maybe changing like creative people tend to say like change their appearance or change what they're into or yeah. change like what music they're listening to every like few months. But I, I do think there's a lot in that in terms of like what challenge you're wanting to do, you're wanting to do stand up. Mm. You get to a certain level, you're like, okay, what's the next challenge? Because it's not like stimulating me anymore. I don't think it's yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's something to be worried about in processing happiness. I just think that's a strength and not everyone's like yeah. you. So some people are gonna go and stay at Greek, Greek butchers for the rest of their life. Whereas yeah. you want constant challenges and we need you need people like that yeah. to do like the kind of things you're doing. Let's say you get into movies and directing. You let's say you write a movie. Mm. If you were the kind of person who would just stay with the one thing, you might write ten of this like similar movies, but you want the next thing. So let's say you write a movie about whatever comedy and then you're like okay that's done next challenge what am i doing i'm doing a documentary okay next challenge what am i doing i'm doing a and it's like that constant oh that's a really nice thing to hear i really like that thank you daryl <laughs> 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 thank god like someone i guess it's like, well it's like yeah i kind of don't i don't really like appreciate where i am in the moment usually but no. now i'm getting i'm getting better at that i think it's a very difficult thing to yeah to because you're so focused on the thing that you're sort of cognizant of all the other things that are going on around yeah because we've been probably not to the same extent, but on a similar sort of journey over the last few years mm-hmm. in terms of going from, like, well, we met each year, you know, what, seven, yeah, about seven years ago. Both bought cameras around the same time, kind of went on a similar journey uh, with that to registering a business last year, mm-hmm. doing more video stuff, um, getting, like, paid jobs, which was, like, yeah, um sitting here doing a podcast now like that sort of just unfolded and unfolded and it, you look back on it now and you think Christ we have come a long way like similar to what you're talking mm-hmm. about you're like where you've come from and it's yeah. it's uh, yeah, difficult to appreciate what's happening in the moment but I think one of the things we talked about the other night was we're sitting doing this everyone's giving up their time around us to help do this for free and it's just kind of quite lovely to be involved with something where got a bunch of people who are like same similar mindsets and mm-hmm. looking for just to enjoy doing something like this and it's yeah thank you david and lee thank you david <laughs> yeah, and lee. thank you i i kind of see it as like a uh like uh i'm almost like a guinea pig to myself because it's like i'm just like trying like new stuff trying to see what sticks and like now i've actually really like kind of honed in like what i really want to be doing and it's like super enjoyable so the challenge is now, like, how do I get paid regularly for it? Like, how do I, mm-hmm. like, generate that sort of, like, yeah. I guess to get paid in my industry, you need audience. But also, um, like, it has to be interesting to me. So yeah. that's kind of, like, my groundwork was, like, I'm going to start living a life that's interesting to me. So and it's that so was easy my to, thought process. Yeah, it's because it's so easy to get trapped doing something that's comfortable, it pays well, but yeah. it's not, doesn't fulfill you in any way. Yeah, yeah. Can I just interject quickly about you having this creative life and moving to Scotland, right? Uh-huh. I think for a lot of people, maybe it's a Scottish thing. Uh, there's a tendency to have the attitude, like, if you stick your neck out, you'll get, like, ripped to shreds, whatever. And if you can let that just bounce off you, then you're fine. You get your creative types. But it's usually if someone's not been like that all their life and then they change, mm. people are like, who's this guy? What's he trying to do? So do you think by moving to Scotland, if you're saying when you were in Canada, it wasn't so much that you were like this? By moving to Scotland, you've been given that freedom because you're not surrounded by who you grew up with. Yeah. And you're not like, yeah, you're not like. It's like a blank canvas, isn't it? It's like a fresh start. It's a massive help to like kind of like have a bit more of a free reign from that like imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though like, so I got like a visa for like two years. That visa is coming up to an end. And so even uh, even the one time that I went back to Canada just for a visit, I kind of had this like anxiety about like being back because mm-hmm. it was i felt like i was gonna like lose somehow like all like my the progress that i made over it was a ridiculous thought but it, the anxious feeling was like fair enough because i kind of untethered myself from those forces they, they exist in every country like 
it's it, whether it's from within yourself or whether it's from other people like yeah. you kind of like do kind of feel anchored you do find kind of like feel a natural resistance when you're pushing into a new space like mm. that just kind of exists um the 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 muscle that we are all developing is becoming comfortable in new rooms and becoming comfortable in new spaces so the, the, the what i kind of came to understand is like i am going back to canada in a couple of months but the muscle that i've developed or the muscle that is like pushing yourself into new rooms and everything that's never gonna go away right i guess it could atrophy if i like s- went back to my old life and like yeah. you know did like yeah. three years that way but but i'm not doing that you know what i mean i'm not mm-hmm. i'm not gonna let that happen i'm going back and with this career yeah right so you, but yeah totally like there's people that are like oh you're doing that now like really yeah, what yeah. you're trying to prove yeah. what why yeah yeah, yeah. those Do are you think people to know sorry Do you think like lockdown helped with that because for me mm. taking myself seriously in terms of like oh yeah i'm a photographer because it, there's it's a lot of years taking photos until you're like you're comfortable to say yeah i'm a photographer i can take money for that making videos doing stuff like a podcast for me lockdown and then i worked from home for another two years or something helped because i'm at home and i'm like who cares yeah. i'm not seeing someone every day and they're gonna be like yeah, oh, there's that, going. that change i can just yeah. kind of disappear and come back <laughs> well definitely like everyone kind of asks like what are we doing like yeah. what are we actually doing with this this time um and so it kind of reframes a lot of the way you think going into lockdown like i started again working at that butcher shop when lockdown started what happened with me was i worked hospitality and then like february of like 2020 right before things like shut down i fell playing basketball and like really hurt myself so i was like at home for six weeks before lockdown and mm-hmm. then i got better and then lockdown started Man. so i was already like i'm i'm done i'm not doing like a whole lockdown thing i think mm-hmm. i gave it like they're like two weeks break the spread and then i was like okay yeah let me do that um and then i was like okay well i don't want to stop like living my life so that's when i went back to work at the butcher shop because it was like a mandatory sor- service like it's food right um so that's in and working like long hours there for that like for those few months before i i left canada was great because it like saved so much money to be able to do all this stuff and take the risk that i'd taken now what's the greek pattern like uh hilarious man. yeah yeah i mean this place was like really crazy it was like almost like so old school like um, I, f- I feel like if it wasn't the law to like s- not smoke inside, everyone would be smoking <laughs> right, inside. Okay. Um, like these, like all the old Greek ladies were like trying to set me up with their granddaughters all the time. <laughs> 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 um, uh, it was, it was a mental place, dude. It was so, so busy at times. Like Orthodox Easter man, we would have like three or 400 lambs and goats that we would like source ourselves. So we'd go out to farms, bring them all to a slaughterhouse, then bring them from the slaughterhouse to the shop. And then we have to get like sell them in one week everyone had their orders and stuff some people would pay us like so they do like a full rotisserie like the whole lamb on the spit Mm -hmm. one time i I, uh a few people paid us to to put them on the spit and like season them and then sew them up on on the thing you gotta like kind of like hammer the the end of the spit through the the head right so that it like stays really sturdy and then we would put the order number on the end of it and then you know one time i got them mixed up so i put one spit with one person when they came to pick it up and the the other person uh, took the wrong one mm-hmm. and then um i got to my boss would have the staff over for easter sunday so i got there at like 2 p.m uh, ready for like enjoying like an easter afternoon uh with the lamb and everything and he's just looking at me like you have no idea what i just had to go through right because the guy who whose lamb i mixed up like called him like at 7 a.m that day mm-hmm. and he was like he, you, your guy gave me the wrong lamb and so he had to go find the lamb that I gave him, go through, like, all the orders that were, like, yeah. in the bin, right? So, like, trying to figure out the phone number. Then he had to drive, like, two hours out of town because, like, Greek people, they're, like, they're not all, like, right in Greek town, right? So people drive, like, hours just to go to this Greek yeah. butcher shop. Uh, so this guy was, like, driving around <laughs> half of Canada <laughs> trying to get the right lamb to the right person. So it was so horrible. What was, like, what was the difference? Was it, like, a more expensive I think what, what it was was, like, the, the end of the spit has to, like, fit in, like, the, like, motorized spinny thing. Mm. So, oh, right, so, so it's specific to that. Yeah, yeah. Rota. So even if, like, it was the right lamb that he paid for and it was the right weight, if the spit itself wasn't proper, yep. then it wouldn't fit and he wouldn't, you'd, you'd have to have two giant 400 pound dudes just sitting there turning it with my hand right. somehow <laughs> so never gonna work so i got there and I immediately felt so guilty because yeah. he literally spent like first of all like i don't know 80 hours that week working in the store this old like 65 year old greek man who i actually really loved it so much and then he was just like 
have no idea what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> so like, oh. <laughs> so you right. fled the country. And I was like, mm, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I fled the country, exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. So in terms of like the grand vision, like where where would you like to see yourself in another five, ten years' time? Five years or, from now. Or longer, like what what's yeah. uh, eleven. <laughs> It's hard to it's hard to like format that because I think like what I care about could be completely different in eleven years and I'm kind of yeah. at peace with that. What I care about now is like telling cool stories and like getting to a point where I have that position. Like I I, I mean, there's so many there's so few people who like really get to like write, direct and like make their stories happen. So like if you write screenplays and then, you know, you can if it's a TV show or a feature film or a short film, like I don't know, one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand that people write get made, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? <coughs> so, like, just getting to that point of, like, being able to, like, get my stories that I want to write made is, like, a huge priority for me. So that's what I'm doing. Like, everything that I do, like, in the creative space, like, I- in the acting world, in, like, in doing, like, production jobs, like, that's all just, like, me trying to get th- to that position, to that, yeah. like, level of influence where, like, my thoughts matter, like, my stories matter. Because at the, at the end of the day, like so many people want that, but y- there's a whole graft that you have to do. You can go indie, which I'm happy to do. Like I've directed uh, a couple of little short films, like one a documentary, one a fictional one, and so like they're one's released. The fictional one I'm still editing, but like you can go indie and you can get some rapport that way. But at the end of the day, like you've got to be constantly involved, constantly like, yeah. meeting people and and gaining that reputation. So that's that's my like goal, and and I'm happy if it takes three years and i'm happy if it takes 11 years <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. but uh, that's kind of where i want to be uh acting is so much fun because you're meeting people who have that that privilege to tell their stories right mm-hmm. every time you walk on set as an actor you're meeting a director and they they have that experience that i want to have that's the experience that i'm hunting is like they are the ones that are telling you what to do how to tell a story yeah. and it's like okay like let me like even if you're just getting a little tidbit of knowledge from how they operate a set like the director is the chief right they're just like in charge of everything there so if you get even just like one little nugget of information about how they carry themselves or how are they how they organize things how they organize like a script breakdown even you know what i mean like just working with a director and being like oh i had this in mind for this line and this this in mind for this line and how this little micro movements in a scene like building a scene is super hard building one scene is super hard you work on a show for not long enough and you see them do this like four or five scenes over the course of two days. Yeah. And it's just like constant, like you are constantly telling a story with every little action, right? It It's so cool. That's the world that I'm like just infatuated with. And who, in terms of what you've worked on as like an extra or an actor, who, who's been your biggest like inspiration in terms of director? Um, the, the there was a I, I don't know his name, but the guy who directed Outlander that I was um like a featured extra on, he was really sharp. Like he and he was super sharp about the story he wanted to tell. But he's also really friendly and like outgoing. So like he was always chatting with people, and it didn't really feel like there were any like barriers up, even mm-hmm. though it was like a massive production in a massive studio. Um, I really thought he was great. Um, I couldn't tell you his name right now. Um, the other guy was the the first time I stepped in front of a camera. Uh, it was a Bollywood film that I worked on, and um, this guy had gone from b- basically doing what you guys are doing now. Like he was doing um, product photography, and then he started doing product videography. And then he started doing adverts, and then him and his friend they were like, "Let's start a production company, limited production company." They started doing um, lots of adverts, and then. The right person came along, and he started. He, he got a script that he liked for an action film, and then you know he's flying to to Scotland and nice. and doing an action film in in Scotland and in India with a huge uh, with a huge star who's uh, John Abraham, who's like a footballer turned uh, model and actor in India. He's like a huge right. mm-hmm. huge deal for them. Um, so like, dude, dude, and dude had no qualms about any of it. Like he was so comfortable and he was so chill. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, uh, there were times where we were having lunch at the same time, and he was just sitting across from me, just chit chatting. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I cool. appreciate those people where like it just doesn't feel like the barrier exists. Like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to be that guy that like that really is like, yeah, you can't be here, you can't do that. And that doesn't that exists in some parts of like the film industry, but overall, like it's pretty easygoing. Like, I I, I find. 
So I think we touched on that when we were taking photos as well. I don't want to keep saying that because I was asking with. You mean our hike? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to soon put you in some dangerous situations for the photos. <laughs> I'm uh, not sure. Our hike and athletics. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if we can get a couple of behind the scenes shots of climbing up the mountain, putting them up just now. Yeah. But um, I was going to ask, so from an outsider's perspective, um, when I was doing the joke writing, I, w- I was on Twitter a lot because it was news related. Mm-hmm. And like you were saying earlier, you have to kind of keep working and build a CV. So my original plan to write jokes was to build a CV to put forward my own TV show idea. Yeah. And it was a comedian that said to do that. But eventually I was just like, I hate news related jokes and it's not funny and it's all about COVID. Right. How many weeks in a row can you write a joke about COVID? I, I don't have that in my skill set. But um, I forgot what I was going to say. What was I talking about before? The writing. Uh, oh yeah, building so CV sort of from an outsider's perspective on say like Twitter and stuff, yeah. co- like the whole comedy world seems quite cliquey in terms of maybe like Scottish comedians, uh, just by looking at like who likes and shares all their own stuff. It all seems mm-hmm. like it's a wee group of pals, and then you get another another group of pals, and there's never a crossover. Right. But is it? Do you find that in comedy from who you've met, or is it the same in acting and stuff like that? Or well, for acting, I can't speak so much on like. I almost think that, like, it, it, for me, right now, from my perspective, it feels like as an actor, I'm on an island and I don't interact with other actors yet. I don't feel like I'm in as an actor yet. Like, I feel like it, it sort of changes when, when you get an agent, maybe, and, and you, you're starting to get on more shows and, you know, oh, how long you been doing this? You have these conversations. Oh, what have you worked on? That kind of thing. Uh, I'm not really in that sort of space yet. So I'm, that's a room that I'm still trying to break into. Mm-hmm. Um but with comedy, I can comment because in comedy, that's like what you talk about. You get to a gig and you're like, what was your last gig? How long have you been doing it? How many gigs have you done? Where do you usually perform? Um, and then that's kind of like the basis for everything. So you kind of you kind of immediately map out like, are you Glasgow based? Are you Edinburgh based? Are you starting out? Are you experienced? Right. Like if people are still if you've been doing it for four years and you're still only doing like open mics then I've already kind of come to a conclusion that, like, you might not actually be that funny. Mm. Yeah. Or you might not be funny at all. <laughs> um, but there's, th- but then, like, there's people... I-, I don't know if it's, like, cliques, per se, or if it's just, like, levels. Like, because there's people who host yeah. shows. People who host shows have been around comedy for a long time, and they, w- they decided they want to get more out of it. So if someone hosts a show, that means they l- they, they're trying to maybe develop other funny people. They're trying to get people in a room to do comedy. Uh, they're trying to sell some tickets, maybe they're trying to make some money, and then they're having comedians in. And I think maybe more of like the cliqueiness comes between those people. Mm. Like, I don't, I don't feel competition between like other people, like other open mic people, because it's like, what, what am I going to do? I'm not going to like fight over a spot, mm. right? That's never. Re- I'm not in the position to choose a spot. If people want to have me because they think I'm funny, then that's great. Yeah. But I think maybe between bookers and stuff, there would be conflict because it's like the bookers are like saying, oh, I got to get a host. I got to get a person to do 20. I got to get a headliner. So I think that's maybe where more of the, the stuff comes in. Once money's involved, really, yeah. it would be more yeah. more of a thing, like more of a, uh, uh, a clash. But for me, like I, I, I'm still a, a visitor almost where it's yeah. like uh, I'm doing it for me. Like everything is just kind of like for my own development and just like trying to enjoy it. So I'm not really – finding any any people that like give like pushback to to what i'm doing in the space true yeah that sounds like quite a nice thing about it is it, is the motive thing is very pure it's you born about something because you wanted to do it for yourself and it was interesting to you rather than it's you're looking for fame or notoriety or anything yeah. like you've never you at no point in any of the time we've spoken so far have you said anything about wanting to be famous or influential anything like that. it's more for the sake of the art and the storytelling and that yeah. was one of the things you said the other night was that it's telling stories which is like a common theme be it be it in a photograph and a video yeah a conversation like it's all it's all about communicating a story yeah um so and the, the, the the fame or, or the recognition comes with audience and that's yeah i think with anything like with comedy the economy is based off the audience so it's like if you're a comedian where you are gravitating to is like where it has a better audience. If I had to choose between one show that was going to be like four four people in the crowd and then a bunch of comedians, or if I'm choosing between a crowd that's actually like 30 good comedy audience people and it's like a small intimate room and I could actually tell jokes and try to hit punchlines and everything, you know which one I'm going to choose because it's the audience that I do it for. Mm-hmm. And also you get more out of it. 
Um, so it's just like that's that's like that's the main currency it seems like in comedy is like is is getting people in seats to to listen to it. You know what I mean? So many people want to tell jokes. There's no shortage of that. Yeah. Um, and do you see when you watch comedy something I th- always feel bad about? Like if I go to a comedy gig, I'll, I'll try and stay near the back. Yeah. Very rarely do I la- like laugh out loud properly. Like I can appreciate a really good joke and I love watching yeah. comedy, but I think because you're so used to watching it on your phone or whatever, like I'm not like pissing myself laughing. And you need that for comedy. Like you need like good laughers. Mm. Whereas I feel like I don't know what you're like. Do you, do you are you like a as an audience member? Yeah. I I kind of go like as a comedy fan. I've always been like more on the side of um, I'm going with the intention to laugh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like that's my plan. It's like I'm going. People are gonna tell jokes. I'm gonna do my best to laugh and, and find them funny. And I, I just think that something happens when you watch really good comedians is that you forget that you even showed up with that intention. Yeah. And it's like, you're just you're yeah, just going to laugh anyway. Like yeah. belly, yeah. like belly laugh. Like, oh, my abs are sore kind of. Yeah. yeah. Like that's what you hope for. Yeah. And don't, was, don't get me wrong. I do yeah. like laugh, but a lot of times I, yeah. I'm, I like, I laugh quietly. I don't know. And then I'm always like, oh, shit, I should like, like a, mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's got to yeah. be reaffirming for you as a, a performer. Yeah. And that's to, to have that, to pe- have people who are literally crying with yeah, laughter. That's, that's nice. I, it, one of my favorites was uh, Ricky Gervais's like Fame. Having watched that for the first time, right. uh, I, could, I can't really probably say quite a few of the things I was laughing about it <laughs> on it because we cancelled. Um, but some of the stuff that I, 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 and it was just on a DVD. But I had to stand up and like walk around the room because otherwise, <laughs> like the tears were streaming down my eyes. Like I, I had to stand up so I wasn't going to cramp in the middle. Like that, yeah. that, that level of uh, kind of like hilarity. Something is incredible and it's you don't often get that like replicated but you still can appreciate like we were talking about press rock you appreciate like the humor and the style yeah but it doesn't it doesn't make yeah. you roll along roll on the ground certain people that tackle me i find like have you seen i think you should leave tim robinson no he's like an ex snl guy and basically he had loads of rejected sketches didn't last very yeah. long in snl and now he's got his own show and it's the stupidest i don't know if you know like bob mortimer the kind of english guy no um so tim robinson anyway i'm hoping that's his name i think it is but he's got all these rejected sketches that are just too weird he takes everything way too far he's just absurd but it's oh my god he's hysterical like you watch that i, like, I couldn't breathe i was like yeah. on the floor like you're saying yeah just had to pause it yes yeah, like when you um, get that it's like so good and comedian wise like harlan williams yeah uh, theo vaughn just that kind of surreal absurd just but, like, the still clever. ability to say like outlandish things yeah yeah nice Good position to be in because yeah. everyone expects it from them too, right? It's, I, it's great. Yeah, I'm more, yeah, with Theo Vaughn, he kind of treads that line of like causing offense, but he's so innocent. And it's yeah. like, is he meaning it? Is he yeah. not? With like Harlan Williams or something's just kind of daft, and he's like a mm. more of an old school comedian. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, whereas you yeah. go to like with someone like, have you come across Frankie Boyle, you're a Scottish comedian? Uh, in person, no, but I, I'm familiar with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, his stuff is just. It's the intention is to to offend, yeah, and like shock, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas yeah, like few ones, but and you d- and you know like that's where the intent is, like that's what he's trying to go yeah. for, rather than like finding a, like a closer line between saying something and being a little bit cheeky with it and getting yeah. away and it's for it's it's, it's, out it's, a, it's a funny thing to witness because like a lot of people who like do like jokes that it it comes off to the audience is like oh they're trying to be offensive and shocking, but the only reason they get laughs is because they're 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 meeting somewhere in the middle with the audience yeah, like they're yeah. saying like you've had this thought you agree with mm-hmm. me yeah i'm gonna let you laugh about it i've got the balls to you. say it out loud you yeah. know what i mean and so like they've also done that joke in a system where it's like they're not gonna do the joke if it's not getting laughs no yeah. so it's funny for me that that like huge comedians like they get like really like, a joke if it's working if it's in their published set or their published uh special and then it gets outrage it's like the the outrage isn't isn't the point it's like it made a lot of people happy to even get to that point yeah, yeah. so i think it th- that joke is, is already a winner you I know thi- i think with the outrage i know people talk about cancel culture and all that but i think with the outrage culture which is probably another thing mm. selling headlines about certain jokes it's yeah. just because they know comedy fans are going to click on it annoyed yeah. and then people who are looking for an excuse to get rid of a comedian they don't like are going to click on it and it's yeah. none of it's real yeah when you say wow. doing the photos like what does that mean showing you oh you're showing me oh, yeah okay. yeah I so we'll put the fo- okay i thought it was just like you put them like in the floating 
All right, no. digital space. <laughs> we'll do that as well. We can right. get. We, we'll we'll send you them all, um, so you can have them and use them however you'd like to. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, enter that section of the podcast cool. where we okay. I'm excited. We we show you the goods, Hiking so to picks. speak. Yeah, and me hanging off a rim. Yep, there is that too. Sweet. That's uh, <laughs> <we'll> st- <laughs> <laughs> that was so innocent as well. <laughs> so we'll do this and not lose the mic. So. I've kind of categorized these as like uh, there was like four elements tonight, so we had right. some basket. So these are sort of more sort of the random shots. Yeah. Then mm-hmm. we had you walking through the flowers, which yeah, for the informed amongst us are called gorse. 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 G U R S E. So it's those yellow flowers. Yeah. Um. Then we had a trip to maidens. Yeah. And uh, there was something else in there, but I can't remember what it is now. Uh, the, the cliff, the rocky cliff. The ledge? Yeah, perhaps. Yes, yeah. Stony walkway. Stony walkway. So this was our first one. We found something that says, do not do this thing on it. So we did it. Yeah. Because, uh, well, if you get deported, it's not on us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already getting deported. It's happening. Exactly, yeah. So <laughs> you time, my time is now can for I rule breaking. D- can I just interrupt? While we're talking about rule breaking with the landscape and the AI, yeah. Just in case people think I'm into AI and you two ganged up on me to get rid of it, right? I was also <laughs> I was in on it. I didn't want the AI either. I was trying to get rid of it, right? I was yeah. in on it. Please don't think I'm in it. I just had to clear it. And also, <laughs> and also it annoyed me. You're like, oh, I agree with Paul. <laughs> I hate AI, Darwin. Like, to be fair, I see the AI as well. So far, you have uh, done a bit of your own editing to it and added things in. Yeah. So it's um, tweaked it. Tweaked it quite a lot. I actually I did it on work. I was doing a training on like diversity. And it's like, write a paragraph on how you can promote diversity in your teams and stuff. And I was like, a paragraph? So I just got AI. Really? Very good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> AI, teach me how to be a good person. Uh, everything said, allegedly I did that. I'm just, it's a joke, it's, right? It's I'm not telling you where I work. I don't represent the views of my work. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly, if you need an AI to teach you about diversity, you know. <laughs> you know but like, how to promote it in the workplace. Yeah. So th- <laughs> 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 uh, back to photos. Okay. Yeah. So I really like that. That's cool. So yeah, and this was like quite fortuitous because you are a big basketball fan. Mm. I um, am. Yeah. And so we were on a fairly uninspiring evening in terms of light at that point in time. Yeah. Uh, rocking about trying to find something like to hang a a story on, and i like what you did there <laughs> that's good work we got you to ha- hang from the rim and uh i think the next one shows a little bit more clearly right in the middle of the hoop yeah no, no, no drum <laughs> uh do not climb do not climb yeah so that was the the, f- the bit of the thought process behind yeah. that but it was actually quite just fortunate if we'd if we'd really been planning we'd have had a basketball and all this stuff scoped out in advance that's but true. uh we fly by the seat of our pants here this I was wasn't oh, right. I wasn't gonna keep in, but hmm. I did because I forgot this morning and I f- was gonna delete out. <laughs> <coughs> but it's an uh, outtake, added this, little outtake. This was like a little more of a just a random on the on the move shot, mm. um, and quite a lot of these I edited to mute the colours down, make it feel more like a film um, mm. simulation type thing. Uh, add some green in. Why did you do that from an artist perspective? <sighs> I felt that was having just met you. Like you've got a notebook. A lot of the things you're talking about were like quite old school. Right. Um. And that was the kind of the feeling I had. Right. And also, there was no color in the night, so I thought, right, lean into the fact there was a lack of color at that point. You should have just left it as you had a notebook and not explained any further. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, you had a notebook, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. Then this was just another headshot. But this was uh, during the your your note writing mm. session right right and you just did a wee kind of over the shoulder movement remember it well yeah, yeah. I think Daryl said something completely oi <laughs> <laughs> oi uh, and that and that's like so that we're th- <laughs> 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 oh it's gone um, this you've got your <laughs> nice uh, hand in the hand in the knee pose what I did like about this was this was taken through a couple of like little flowers. <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> I don't know what's funny anymore. <laughs> <laughs> just watching them laughing as well. Is this just one of those where you start laughing, you can't stop, mm. and it derails the whole. <coughs> oh. Derail. Derail, you can. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
I like this because this was shot through some of the, the red campaign another wild flower yeah. uh, that we had on the, the hillside. Oh, is that the... Uh, what's so that's what you've got a couple of splodges of colour there oh, and nice. your hat's gone slightly purple. Okay. Um, That's not enhancement. That's uh, That was just because we were shooting through the flowers there. Love it. And that concludes that wee series. So... What is the name of that series? I call that Shorts. Shorts? Yeah, just random shorts. Wow. <laughs> is that because <laughs> they had a notebook? <laughs> <laughs> What was the creative uh, the inspiration behind the series name Shots? So then we're into what I'm calling goths, because I'm very literal as a person. All right. It's just simple, man. That's yeah. cool. Simple. I've that's learned something from that. That sort of know. looks like POV, like a POV shot, and someone's like lying on the ground and I'm walking towards them. That's exactly where my mind goes to for some reason. Yeah. That's cool. So there's a few of these, just because you, we shot you nothing, oh, that faster cool. shot yeah. So just to get a few different looks. There's a third one. Uh, well, Matt, when you look at the difference between the two, I have rather enhanced the yellows just to make it pop a little bit more. Yeah. And actually, this wasn't... I shouldn't say any of this because it wasn't particularly in focus, so I had to do quite a lot to try and pull your face right. back into a sharper okay. because you were walking towards me yeah, and yeah. I was like shooting like quite were a Were you on manual shutter. focus? Before no, I wasn't. I was relying on Fuji's... Uh, Fujifilm... They're less than fabulous autofocus systems. Oh, all right. This podcast is not sponsored by Fujifilm. It's not, no. Nor will it ever be. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Nor will it ever be. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming for you, Sony. And then, hey, that's I, had nice. an, and then I, I had an idea when I woke up that morning, the next morning, uh, and I thought, I'll maybe go for like a geometric, like yeah. sort of, so I took s- a series of those and then sort of that yeah. cool. bunged them in together. And then I thought, oh, maybe, maybe they shouldn't be right, so symmetrical. And that was Fujifilm that gave you that idea, right? Yeah. Just yeah. recover. Fuji is, uh, I, w- I want to be a Fuji ambassador <laughs> one day, please. Thanks, Fujifilm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I, th- I think I prefer the geometric kind of mm. block of yeah, shapes Yeah, I, I like there. that one, yeah. So then if we go back out, we're going to the next aptly named Notebook. Notebook. And we're not going to bring Ryan Gosling in at any point here. <laughs> Canadian, two Canadian actors. In there film. you go. Oh yeah. yeah. Have yeah. you seen Ryan Gosling in Goosebumps when he was like eleven or something? No, I didn't realize he did it's that. I think it's, it's like say cheese and die again. I brought up Goosebumps twice in this episode. Yeah, I know. It's like <laughs> I really like Goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> right, sorry, keep going. So you had there. Yeah. Okay. No, none of it really <laughs> happened. Ryan, yeah. Ryan Gosling's in it when he's like ten. It's quite funny. I have no creative direction. That's just quite like the idea. Yeah, that's cool. Um. Is that just the... Uh, how do you get that effect on the background? Post-production. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there would there would have been no way to like yeah, get yeah. you as a stationary person. Okay. But uh, it's the world's moving around you, and you're, but you're static, and I'd love it encapsulating it in a notebook. It's, uh, if nice. I'm given a moment to tour to think about it all, that's what I'll go with. Did you use AI to come up with that? That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have done that for all these. <laughs> like, if you had to put a wee suggestion and got an AI response out. So then, none of these photos are necessarily stand alone, but mm. as a collection, I feel like they tell the story of you and the notebook and the writing side mm. of your, uh, how you get your creativity down in paper. So we'll just flip through these, but uh, it was, this was slightly staged. We did get you to sit down on the rock, and uh, it wasn't that you just said, like, I need to stop. But we had talked about a few things, and you actually did write some stuff down. I did. Can you remember what? Skin in the game. Yeah. Um, doing a best man speech, but instead of having a prepared speech, you just bring uh, a bunch of new material to try out. <laughs> 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 so you're just suddenly you're at the at the head table of the wedding, and you're just doing crowd work <laughs> with the two grandmas <laughs> in the front. <laughs> I think that'd be a fun, so diverse, fun experiment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, oh yeah, then photo strategy. W- uh, women are not objects. That means that because <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daryl Daryl said that he learned that p- doing portraits for men, um, you always have to have men doing an action, some sort of movement. Oh, yeah. And I thought that was actually, you know, like not very uh, not very feminist because why do I have to be doing something right? But then yeah. they don't. What are you saying about them? Exactly. So now I refuse to ever do anything. <laughs> 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 All the name of equality. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure how it happened. I think you. T- 
alienated a female of listenership a little bit more <laughs> there. <laughs> and uh, Paul neatly pulled his back just to a, like a, an even point. I'm bringing it back. <laughs> oh, he started off as if he was going to be the hero, but then turned it around to be about him not wanting to do yeah, it. Yeah, uh, I'll just use this since she's lazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to bring back Fujifilm and women. It'll be Fushi film. <laughs> <laughs> So then again, that, that over-the-shoulder look. Mm. Have you done some modelling in the past? I have. You have. For a beer. For a beer. Menabrea. Well, kind of beer. Menabrea. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. It wasn't Did like, you not listen? It wasn't, no. it wasn't like, you know, like I'm like wearing like a, like some sort of like clothing collection. It was like a lifestyle shoot where like they like made like a nicely decorated flat with like all this like charcuterie and like all of their beer around, like in bottles and in, in like pint glasses and stuff. Do you recommend that particular beer? It's a nice beer. Yeah, it's nice. Really nice beer. It's, a, it's a premium Italian oh, lager. Really? Yeah. A wee Menabrea yeah. and a wee number three. Mm. Premium Italian lager. There we go. If you're looking to that camera and say that, just with a... Menabrea. Premium Italian lager. That was very Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and then... Just trying to try get a woman back by mentioning him. <laughs> <laughs> and then just trying to uh, peek into your notes. Yeah. But he uh, did a very good job of masking it with his, with his claw hand. <laughs> <laughs> Who's you are not drawing my hands yet, thankfully. No, I, I, I like you, at this moment I can show you what your left hand looks like. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I especially like the, the, the no neck. It's going that way. Well, I haven't drawn in your beard yet. Ah, uh, okay. Fair You're enough. very sort of a, like drawing like that, I think. This is all it. Paul's world. It doesn't <laughs> doesn't reflect reality. <laughs> Okay, so that was the last one in that sec. So then we're on to Maidens. Whoa. I went for a little that's cinematic. That's really cool. Uh, yeah. Teal and orange. That is great. Because at that point, we didn't have too much Colin Square. We, we did get a fantastic sunset just as we were thinking about heading home. But wow, uh, that's I was a great shot. Gonna he's he's making you your biceps wider. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> adding bicep aids. <laughs> 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 did, did, you, did you see that already? I've had a peek this morning. I love. There's oh, a few shots man. that I loved. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just what lean into the orangeness in the jacket and the kind of blueness that we had in the sky and uh, pull those colours out a bit. So I kept with that, and then wow. so we got you to walk away from us. Yeah. yeah. And then we got you to walk back towards us because we are we're pushing the boat. <laughs> out that is cool, man. Like 28 days later shot. Yeah. To me, I think inter- I'm thinking Interstellar when I saw that first one. Mm, right. Yeah, Do you remember yeah. when they're walking in the the very watery planet and they're walking away from yeah. us? Yeah. Yeah. That's. Oh, dude, this is so cool. And for our work and for I, I'd say quite a lot of photos and video stuff for like my my day day job. Yeah. Um, and I'm always thinking about okay, if you take a portrait, you really want a landscape because it the format like depending where you're posting it changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's something I'm trying to be a bit more like aware of when we're out and about doing stuff. Is like right. if it's going on Instagram, portrait works better for the most part. But mm. if you, I prefer landscape. Like as a just as an orientation, right? Um, so that's why you got a wee portrait there as well. Also, I think we've talked about it before. The fact that Instagram now controls what you should be doing in terms of creativity, yeah. what songs you should be using, what format. Oh, it's just like piss off. Yeah, Do yeah, stuff. Yeah, this is what does the best. So let's do more of just that. Yes, yes. that like bottleneck creativity. Yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, silhouette because it had to be done. That's really cool. And as a as a finale. I was wondering when that was coming. That was my oh, favorite one. Yeah. That was right awesome, on. yeah. Uh, it was a, like an R one I woke up the next morning. Kind of like we talked about like the last couple of episodes, I think, with like the John Cleese book. Yeah. They, you, I edited a lot, most of these the night before. Yeah. Uh, and I was up early one the next morning. I was like, I had ideas and I woke up for some reason. And so I just jumped on the laptop and finished doing, like just masking out, like, because yeah. I took s- a series of photos of you as you walked along that wall, yeah, yeah. and then just m- like mashed you out and like imported it. Into That's a isn't that a hard shot to get though? Because don't you have you're not on sticks, right? So you're shooting no. that freehand, which yeah. means you're the background didn't move for all one, two, three, four, five, six of those shots. I admire your confidence in me. Good job. <laughs> Everyone, round of applause for Stuart. Like honestly, no, that's like pretty cool, right? But no, I. I <laughs> <laughs> um, that's not easy. But no, I th- that is a, a shot. I was like. I mean, most well not shot because it was a series shot, but as a, right. as a concept, I, I quite liked. No, when I was really nice. Did you know you were doing that when you took the no, shot? No, not at the time, no. Okay. But it like came to me after the fact. Man. I wish I'd like had the foresight. Cool. So, 
Psycho, Aquaman, Doctor Sister, Deadpool, then the Vampire Diaries. Yeah, well, I thought about that when I was like uh, putting it together as a as a composition. Yeah, that is really cool. <laughs> that, that is totally like uh, if I became Sarah McLaughlin overnight and wanted to like make my album cover. Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah. If you're talking about changing your voice and stand up, you could be like many voices that could be your special mm. can you just change every two minutes mm. different style <laughs> yeah jim carrey i'll, I'll give Anthony a Desmond. i'll give a comment like so one of the actors that i worked on in the little short film that i directed his name is silas the who d- also does comedy and mm. i recently saw him do like a live set like five minutes and he's he's eastern european he's from transylvania and so in his act he's like flip-flopping between right. different like kind of mm. like stereotype accents versus like how he really talks and then like there's a scottish accent and he's doing all really fast it is funny man He's really great. That's a cool name. Was yeah. it Silas? Silas Sabolt. See, there's a Silas in my school, I'm sure. I take it he's not from here. Uh, no. 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 He's Yeah, I think he came from, like, Transylvania straight to Glasgow, if I'm not mistaken. Right, okay. Yeah. But is that, that's, <coughs> that's, that's, so that's, cool. just, that's all I've got. What yeah. a collection that is. Thank you, man. So, we will, we will make those available to you. And then, if there's any royalties to be had, at some <laughs> point in the future. When you make it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll put tiny wee copyright things in the bottom. And there's <laughs> other uh, behind the scenes shots of like Struan taking photos of you and a couple yeah. of extras. But we'll, we'll, as well, we'll throw but those into the, the edit of this podcast. We'll for see them. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Cool. Make me look like a really dreamy sort of. Oh yeah, you know, he's a dreamer. He's a visionary. No, he's an idiot. <laughs> 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 um, Thanks, guys. So with the uh, the things you wanted us to cover or you thought might be interesting to cover, one thing stood out to me. I was trying to save it to the end. Mm. Uh, there's a story about blowing up a car. Yeah. Yes, I, I blew up a car in uh, in the middle of Glasgow. It happened. Um, this was like on that Bollywood film on the summer that I worked on. Right. Uh, and uh, I thought it was just going to be like recreationally. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. Also, just sub 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 circle around. When I this is the first time I ever was in front of the camera, and uh, it was a Bollywood film, but it was set in Iran. Right. Okay. And so I think the reason I got the role in front of the camera was because we were like running out of Scottish people who had like agents, like whether it was like extras or actors in Scotland that look like they could pass for Persian. So like I'm like not by any means like Persian looking, but like at least I have like a bit of a tan, mm-hmm. like darker hair, darker eyes, so it could work. Yeah. So I shot two days, and I was in character in, in both days. I was like kind of like a hacker guy um, in like the bad guy's base. And then so we do the first scene on the first day, and we're going to do the second scene on the second day. And um, the scenes were, were taking place right after one another. So the second day, makeup gets a hold of me, and makeup's like starting to put all this like makeup on me. And I'm like, hold on, whoa, whoa. I didn't have any makeup on the first time. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. I'm pretty sure I don't need makeup. And then they're like, no, 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 you're, you, you need makeup today. I'm like, oh, what's going on? Like, well, I'm pretty sure I'm right, but we'll, we'll find out. Anyway, I look at my like my selfie camera and my phone, and I'm like fully like three shades darker no, <laughs> than, I, really? than I was like before they started putting the makeup on. So I went up to the director. I'm like, hey, man, uh, this isn't like supposed to be happening. Yeah. Right? He's like, what is? Is it like the Team Why America scene? Yeah, it was <laughs> bad. <laughs> it was right? bad. Yeah. So th- so they um they, they they took it off before the actual scene. Um, but I was like part of the terrorist force. That's not why I blew up the car. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so on that job, I, I jumped from being like a COVID marshal, which is basically just like an entry level position. Um, and I ended up being a special effects assistant. So I worked under the guy that was like doing like all the blank firing weapons. Um, right. And so like we had like a bunch of Uzis and AK-47s mm-hmm. that like were like modified. So you couldn't you couldn't put a live round and you couldn't Alec Baldwin someone. Yeah. But you could um, you could you could load them. You could load blanks and then, you know, shoot blanks. So you have to have some safety because you could get like some some uh, splash or bullet flare like it's hot, it's hot firing weapons. Yeah. So you still have to be really careful. So I was working out of this guy that's teaching me a lot about guns. He was also the explosions guy. And uh, so we're at like. Uh, I think it was like Brown Street, which is like right off the Clyde, mm-hmm. you know, like kind of like in between Central Station and uh, Anderson Station, like under the uh, Kingston Bridge. And um, we're uh, the whole day is basically the scene. We're just doing one scene, blow up a car, and then moped guy drives away. That was the whole day, right? Um, so, so I learned something cool. Also, like those explosions, they're, they're real, right? So you do a lot of gas, like propane and stuff, like mm-hmm. shoot out the flames. But then you add a lot of like um, mulch, like garden mulch, and like um, 
uh, like styrofoam, like little bits, so that you have like a cool debris. Right. Because right. right. in real life, if apparently, like, if you saw a car blow up, it would just kind of be like an empty explosion. Yeah. There's yeah. like right. a lot of like heat boom, but not really like a whole like not cloud, right? Yeah, so the styrofoam flies yeah. out and breaks, and kind of looks like concrete. Is it like yeah, painted? exactly. I think so Jackass did that, put, right? Put chunks it, of yeah. concrete in there, which are just like styrofoam blocks, um, and like a couple of like fake body parts and stuff. And you put that all in like these like garden plants, like these like iron um, giant pots that are like, you know, 80 kilos each. So it took two of us to put them in there and then you fill them up and then you put the, you know, fiery stuff underneath and it's a whole ordeal. And then, you know, you've got like security and, and like um, like police on the day to like make sure everything's fine. Mm -hmm. So my boss, the special effects guy is like, OK, we're going to get ready. We're going to set up and then. uh we were getting ready to go. The police are like, no one can be behind this line. But we had parked the special effects van, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> like closer to the explosion. And I was like, I want to watch. Right. So <laughs> my smart self gets in the gun van to watch this explosion, which is only like 40 meters away from the actual explosion. And then I'm watching it in like the re rear view mirror of the van because right, it's parked right. the other way. And someone else who was like watching saw me looking through the mirror because we weren't actually even supposed to be looking at it. Oh, not at So it, I had yeah. the best seat in the house to watch this car blow up. It was awesome. And <laughs> sure enough, we did huge flames. The effects worked exactly right. And then my, my boss, special effects guy, and the firefighters, they come and they put out the, the flame after the, the shot. They so they yell cut, then immediately you got to put it out. It, and like 30 seconds later, my boss is just like, all right, get in there and see if you can pull anything out. I'm like... What are we pulling out? Is like so all these like clips and things that were holding all the cast iron, mm. um, right, okay. everything that was in place. He was like, "Yeah, just start pulling stuff out." I'm like, "Dude, it just it blew up, man!" <laughs> like so for me, like I was like, "I just walked onto this job. Like, is this like there's there's no step in between? Just like boom, and then like send the kid in, let's yeah. <laughs> see, see what he can get." It'd be it a lot worse crazy, if you were man. still three shades darker. <laughs> get in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was the, so that was the experience. But um, I mean, I ended up like the best part of that was like I got the best seat in the house. Yeah, because like oh, everyone awesome. else was instructed not to watch and not to, you know, because they didn't want any like recording it or anything because it was like a big moment. Um, and here I am talking about it on a podcast. But uh, <laughs> is that, <laughs> did is that film out? Uh, no, it's actually not. No, but it's it's fine. Did, um, did they warn like a? Because I'd imagine folk going over the Kingston Bridge and then they just see an explosion like just below them. Yeah, I don't know if it would have been visible because there's like some decently like tall buildings and stuff. Everything right. around was like kind of closed off. Like if okay. we, we followed all like the safety protocols and stuff, and like we had like police presence there to make sure like everything went off smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, but it was uh, it was a really fun moment. And then just from from our boss to be like, jump in. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't even know what what I'm supposed to be pulling out. Like these things are like eighty kilos, and I'm in like the hot wreckage of a car just like yeah, yeah you think you work out 10 minutes later cool thing cool off yeah, yeah yeah did you get anything um well th the things that i was pulling out were just stuff that we had to like throw in a in a big dumpster like a huge bin but it was and then you those big iron pots that like held all the, the debris we reused those because yeah, they didn't even cool. they don't even budge like that's how heavy they are Jesus. yeah yeah what kind of car did you blow up uh it was like a uh four-door sedan type thing like right. maybe like a toyota Impala or something. So like is it that. working okay? No, no. You just you is just like an old you blow up car? something old. Right. I wish I blew up my van. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it was just like a hunk of junk. I don't even think it was like insured for the road or right, anything okay. like that. You just yeah, you just use something. That Probably something sort of even right. Something expendable. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it, what's interesting too is a lot of the cars that we use for like stunts on that movie, they were like beaters. Like they were all like on their last legs. Like so many of these stunt cars, you think that they're gonna be like supercars like i don't know like yeah because you see the movie and it's mm -hmm. all like driving fine these things are like backfiring all the time they're stalling all the time they have trouble starting them up so we had like like um like uh mechanics basically mm -hmm. always on set just like yeah. to to get these cars in working order it was That's really fun when when you crash one and then they like just they need to do another take and they just go in there with a hammer and like uncrash it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it was really cool you learn all these little secrets. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. So yeah. is that film due for a release? Or is it yeah, it is. It was it's, it was originally slated for January of this year, and I think it got pushed back. So it's still in like post production and everything. Okay, so yeah. we might be able do to see like your reflection. Yeah, <laughs> in the mirror. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> and do we have a name that we can look out for? It's Tehran. Tehran. Yeah, Tehran, starring John Abraham. That was oh. a fun one. Sounds fun. Yeah. Sounds yeah. interesting as well. That was good. Well, 
we've already seen our drawings, right? You guys haven't finished. Uh, we haven't finished. Shall we give ourselves a couple of minutes? Yeah. Um, we'll finish and we'll then we'll do a wrap up. <laughs> All right, my masterpiece is finished. This is an art attack. We no longer require any drawing <laughs> on this set. <laughs> what do you guys think? It looks oh. like something out the twits. <laughs> 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 it's actually Daryl. You look so like evilly, sort of slightly pissed off. <laughs> it kind of looks like someone left the eight-year-old alone with an iPad and like the lines. Just you know, when you're using like a stylus and it doesn't go where you want it to yeah, go. Wait, yeah. Paul, do you want to do right? If we put this in the camera and try and move it around, do you want to do a voice for this? Oh God. You want me to make a voice? We want you to yeah, voice you're it. a voice actor. Oh, okay, Jesus. Okay. Okay, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> give it to him. Do, do, do I hold it or? No, just just voice it now. Right. Cool. Okay. What do I? What do I say? <laughs> you're gonna go. S- gonna go Scottish. Good afternoon, guys. My name is uh, Paul Matt. I'm here with uh, Daryl and Daryl and Struan. They had me on their podcast. Been a great time. I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, really hoping that uh, no one ever sees this drawing. <laughs> but uh, you know, now that it's on the internet, uh, anything can happen. So uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's good. I, I looks like I have a huge chin, uh, <laughs> and uh, I've got the several burst blood vessels in my eyes. <laughs> and I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, oh God. <laughs> That's a good way to end it. Yeah. <laughs> And then that one. Uh, this is not a good way to end it, but uh, <laughs> 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 I tried to catch the That's sort of the, the texture of the hair, but I, then I feel like I just completely misconstrued what the, your hair is actually like. Oh, I see what he did there. Not just a pretty face. Hey, right, not just a pretty face. <laughs> um, it's yeah, it, and I see, I, I do see my torso. It's <laughs> <laughs> captured like what might happen in like 30 to 40 years right. time yeah. <laughs> John, wait, I remember my fucking hunchback <laughs> my next I, mean, I don't know hey guys welcome I to really don't know what yeah. happened it's like an 80 year old I really don't know what happened to Daryl's face it's really I'm like a fucking baked potato <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you're so Honestly, I'm, I'm fucking raging and that you're, I invited you on. Fuck off. You're, <laughs> way back to Canada. I'm like phoning immigration. You know, the troll face guy. I feel like for some reason, like the beard and my hair and eyes are sort of like kind of on point. And, uh, you're quite accurate. Yeah. Like, I, uh, it's actually kind of horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be in my in my nightmares. Isn't it? <laughs> but I guess I could live here. I think, <laughs> I think you, that's, get, yeah. you get someone else. Really <laughs> catch the perspective of the studio. <laughs> that's like, I, I, why do I prioritize that? You know, it's like <laughs> I gotta get these lines proper. You see the bigger picture. Nailed it. No, that's uh, that was an, an interesting exercise. I feel yeah. horribly guilty. They've just done these like beautiful portraits of me with their like super flashy cameras, and they're like, "Here's a sharpie and a, and a canvas. <laughs> <laughs> just ruin our self image, please." <laughs> It's even accurate to the way we have like our mics in front of us as well, though. You come straight out towards your mouth, and mine's yeah. kind of rising from all. I, I, I like I my shirt that's monoblock. I nailed it. <laughs> yeah. I nailed it other than you, the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> but even anyway. down to the, the soundproofing in the walls. Yeah. That's the most time I've spent on a drawing, to be fair. So um, maybe ever. Yeah, I'm probably in a similar boat. Yeah. Nice. Well, <laughs> there yeah. you go. Thank you, you for coming. You can and keep uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have them up in the studio from Florida. I think those are quite. Yeah. They had a certain je ne sais quoi. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. Oh. I'm just making him feel at home because he speaks French. Oh, yeah, nice. The room is Bon. <laughs> <laughs> Oi. What, um, what did you want your titles to be if we thank you? Chief audio producer, engineer audio producer. Okay. Yeah. An assistant yeah. camera person. Camera. I'm not even assessing at this point, just camera <laughs> operator. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, no, much appreciated. And thank time. you for coming down. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed that. That was yeah. good. That's cool. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you in the the movie and stand up or whatever you're going to do. And if we can score you in on again for a quick chat before you you leave for we'll Toronto, then yeah. that'd be fantastic. Alrighty. Thanks, Oi. guys. Thank you. Cheers. Over and out.